Welcome everyone. This is the Northwestern University Department of Biomedical Engineering's weekly seminar series that we restructured this quarter to examine current research on COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 infection. My talk today is targeted at the junior and senior level undergraduate and first year graduate students in our department. My goal today is to give you an expert overview of the current uh, prophylactic and therapeutic landscape for antiviral molecules to, pre to treat and prevent SARS-CoV-2. I'm happy to report to you that significant progress in the antiviral front has been made at this early point in the pandemic. Hi, I'm Pat Kaiser, and I've spent the last 20 years working on different ways of attacking the human immunodeficiency virus using a wide variety of clinical antiretroviral agents. I think it's fascinating to see antiviral and pharmacological history unfold in front of our eyes and to see how rapidly the scientists and industry and NIH uh, in, and in collaboration with clinicians across the globe have started to develop therapeutic options for COVID patients based on sound science. So the limits for today's presentation. Um, COVID-19 therapeutics is a rapidly developing area with new papers uh, appearing every day. Based on other epidemics, I feel it's unlikely that experimental preclinical compounds will impact this epidemic. The timing is bad and the, the need is acute. So to keep our focus on the highest quality research with the biggest potential impact, I'm gonna limit my discussion today to agents with plausible mechanisms of action with a reasonable cell-based antiviral activity and lack of cytotoxicity. I'll also limit it to agents with high quality animal data and a history of human use, preferably a phase three study, uh, which, which we have for remdesivir, or a phase two study. Basically meaning that the, uh, the safety has been proven and the uh, agent is queued up to try to do a, uh, another phase two or a phase three efficacy trial. As far as human studies go and current clinical research, I'm going to limit our discussion today to controlled uh, studies that have controlled groups and not just misleading or uncontrolled observations, observational studies where there really uh, are a lot of those out there right now that, that, that uh, we need to wade through and, and I think uh, exclude. So the plan for today is to cover SARS-CoV-2 uh, drug targets and then go over assays to test drug activity, both uh, cell-based assays and uh, animal models, and then to go to antiviral compounds, focusing briefly on hydroxychloroquine and then remdesivir. And then we'll look at a couple of the, the best studies with human data on immune modulators to treat COVID immunopathology. And finally, we'll look into the future about some monoclonal antibodies that are being queued up uh, for study for phase one and phase two studies this summer to uh, create very potent therapeutics uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Someone asked me after my last talk on why we don't have antiviral drugs or so many antiviral drugs, and I answered that we actually do. We live in an era of fantastic antiviral drugs against some of the most pathogenic viruses known to man. I view progress in the antiviral area as one of the great advances of biomedical science in this century because of the number of people that have been affected by these agents. We also have, uh, well, here we have a plot of the number of approved drugs uh, versus time and the different viruses that make us really sick. One of the critical features, if you look into each one of these, uh, each one of these series of approvals is <clears throat> and you definitely see this in HIV and each, uh, hepatitis C virus uh, drugs, is that you start with less potent agents with higher doses and lots of side effects and dose-limiting toxicities, and move to drugs with higher potency, lower doses, and fewer dose-limiting side effects. The, when these agents are combined with other medications, you see this increase in potency um, and the reduced potential to develop resistant mutations of the virus against two drugs that are simultaneously on board in an infected individual. And you also see that the cure rate and degree of viral suppression increases 
proportionally over time as these new drugs come on uh, come on board. And now uh, they have very high cure rates of HCV because of the great drugs that are available now. Many of these drugs in this list, you can't see them, but if you go and uh, read this review article, it's a, it's a great article. And many of these drugs are nucleoside analogs that interfere with viral RNA or DNA synthesis that's required to make an infectious virient. Most notable and relevant to the COVID 2 epidemic are the advanced prodrugs, Sobisubir for hepatitis C virus and tenofovir alafenamide for HIV. I've actually spent the last seven years working on tenofovir alafenamide and trying to come up with better ways to deliver it. Both of these drugs, tenofovir alafenamide and Sobisubir, are advanced prodrugs, meaning that they are designed and engineered to be metabolized by the body. And remdesivir is the first nucleoside prodrug authorized to treat uh, COVID-19. Luckily, we we're able to get a head start because of the ongoing uh, MERS coronavirus and SARS uh, coronavirus 1 epidemics that came before the current epidemic. And this little head start was, was really important because it helped scientists develop animal models and get the first peek at therapeutics that might be effective against uh, SARS-CoV-2. There are several uh, CoV-2 antiviral drug targets that we should talk about. I've highlighted the ones in red that have uh, previous precedent with other coronaviruses and, uh, and have viable candidates that are currently being looked at clinically to fight COVID. The first are viral entry inhibitors. Those would essentially prevent a cell from being infected, and the, the main ones there are antibodies. And then there are uh, drug targets that target the uh, viral genome replication by causing the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to shut down or incorporate an unfunctional nucleotide and stop the growing copy of the viral genomic <coughs> RNA from being produced and therefore uh, not being able to produce a uh, infectious variant. So I put together a concept map to describe how leading therapeutic agents could be used for both prevention and treatment of SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID. There are three basic approaches shown here. First is to use a drug to prevent infection uh, with the virus, and that's called pre-exposure prophylaxis. There's current examples of this in HIV and also in malaria, where you take a drug like an oral anti antiviral or an injection of a long-acting antibody or antibody cocktail that would uh, prevent a high-risk individual from being infected. The next is to, the next approach is to blunt the acute phase of the viral infection. And there are a number of ways to do this. The first would be uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. So you give an agent to someone who thinks they've been exposed. Um, I haven't heard a lot about that yet. The approach that a lot of uh, other folks are looking at in terms of the uh, five classes of drugs that uh, could be used against uh, CoV-2. The first would be repurposed antivirals. And the idea here is to try antivirals that would inhibit other viruses, such as uh, antiretrovirals for HIV. Uh, my opinion on this is I don't have much hope for this because it would be like winning, winning uh, a lottery if, if a drug specifically designed for one virus would work against uh, another virus with a completely different set of proteins. These are highly engineered compounds and there's no reason to expect that uh, protease for HIV would work against the COV-2 protease, for example. Although people are trying that and aren't really seeing much as far as I can tell. Um, another category is repurposed drugs of unknown mechanisms of action or uh, mechanisms of action that will soon be discovered. And uh, one of those in this category is hydroxychloroquine, which is uh, very famous, which I'm going to cover today a little bit. <clears throat> and then uh, there are generalized RNA, replicase, uh, RNA virus replicase inhibitors, such as uh, leading candidate here is remdesivir. But there are other uh, general antivirals like favipiravir and ribavirin that are advanced clinically and, and uh, potentially could be used uh, against this virus perhaps in combination with remdesivir. Then there are specific SARS-CoV-2 antivirals. Uh, we don't have any of those yet because we haven't had time to develop them. In principle, they could have been developed against MERS and SARS-CoV-1, 
but uh, uh, that work uh, basically stopped and, and hasn't advanced clinically, so I won't be covering that. And then finally, neutralizing antibodies that are engineered very, to be very potent, that are uh, potentially injectable as a therapeutic or given as IV intravenously. Those uh, are advancing, and I'll talk more about that at the end of the talk. And then the last area, which is uh, highly active right now, are inhibitors of the inflammatory immunopathology. And these are come in several different areas. You have the cytokine agonists, such as agonists against IL-1 and IL-6, really important pro-inflammatory cytokines. There are also steroids, different kinds of steroids and different steroid treatments that folks are looking at, clinicians are looking at, and adding interferons back in because we know that COVE-2 is, is an expert at suppressing interferon signaling. So maybe we could add the interferon back in using some interesting drug delivery. These are probably the five best drug candidates published to treat uh, COVE-2 infection. They all have been shown in cell-based assays to have modest uh, inhibitory concentration against SARS-CoV-2. They're remdesivir, shown here, uh, chloroquine, favipiravir, ribavirin, galadesivir, all of these uh, have history of use in humans and potentially could be further advanced against uh, COV-2. And then finally, a investigational drug that hasn't made it to phase one yet, but I know that they're, the company that uh, owns the patent rights of this drug is trying to move this forward, EID 2801. So cell-based infection assays used in antiviral screening are really the workhorse assays that can teach us a lot about how therapeutics can disrupt the viral life cycle. The assay for COVE-2 is in African green uh, monkey kidney cells. And the way the assay works is you have multiple wells where you grow these cells in a monolayer and you add drug into different wells at different concentrations. And then uh, you wait a while, let the drug get into the cells, or if you want to test whether it's outside the cells, you may uh, have a very short duration of exposure to the drug. And then you add, um, the, add the virus. And then you wait 48 hours. Um, and you can then go into that monolayer and stain for proteins that are expressed uh, because of uh, viral infection. Simultaneously, at different drug concentrations, cytotoxicity is done in another plate where you don't add the virus and you just look at the cytotoxicity of the, of the drug to try to interpret the, uh, the, the, the viral outcome. And remdesivir in this assay has been shown to have an effective concentration, 50%, and I'll go over that in a minute, of uh, 0.8 uh, micromolar. You can see in the inhibition curves, really learn a lot of uh, exciting things about, about the drug that I'd like to point out. First, you can see that you have a double Y plot of percent infection and percent cell death versus concentration of remdesivir. You can see that the 50% of infection, you have a concentration of about 0.8 micromolar of uh, remdesivir. And that's a, a, a characteristic of this drug uh, with these cells and uh, a particular concentration of virus. You can see across the whole range of concentrations here tested, there's very little cytotoxicity of remdesivir. Um, you can ratio the 50% cytotoxicity concentration, the EC50, and create a measure of therapeutic index called the selectivity index for the drug in this assay. And that's important to have a high selectivity a uh, high selectivity index to, uh, to show that at a level where you can inhibit the virus, that the drug is not that uh, uh, cytotoxic. You can also see here the curve for uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, also a reasonably potent inhibitor. Um, you can see here, for example, with this drug, it doesn't have a very good selectivity index. Although, uh, again, similar potency to chloroquine and remdesivir, but it's likely that this drug would be quite toxic and may be difficult to develop uh, against uh, COVE-2. NIH and NIAID are developing a macaque model for SARS-CoV-2 at the Montana site, where they can work with all kinds of nas nasty uh, respiratory viruses. 
In this model, they take almost 3 million cell culture infectious doses, 50%, where one uh, total cell culture infectious dose, 50%, is the dose of variance that would infect 50% of the cells in the, of, in the first round of infection in cell culture. So uh, basically almost 3 million of those, which is a lot of virus. And they challenge uh, the, the rhesus macaques in this model with this dose uh, by uh, multiple uh, mucosal routes, uh, intratracheal, intranasal, ocular, and oral. Um, they see changes in respiration immediately on day one and interstitial pneumonia in the terminal bronchioles of the, of the macaques. And uh, interestingly, uh, very similar uh, viral shedding as to the human. And I think this model is gonna turn out to be important for looking and investigating uh, several therapeutic and prophylactic approaches for anti antivirals in this uh, in this epidemic, and it's very exciting. And the paper is currently under review, and I give you the reference here. They, if you look into the preprint, uh, they developed a clinical score which includes multiple factors uh, that measure uh, disease progression. You can see you get immediate disease progression and then resolution of that. Um, it's clear that in this model, the disease is not as uh, uh, pathological to the macaques, and they uh, clear the virus pretty quickly without, uh, without any therapeutic options. The, uh, the cell tropism uh, in this model overlaps. In my previous talk in this series, I showed that SARS uh, coronaviruses infect ACE2 positive type 2 pneumocytes in the uh, alveolus of the, of the lung. And uh, they see the same thing in this macaque model. Here you can see staining for the nucleoprotein in the alveoli of the macaques. And uh, you can see that uh, the uh, type 2 pneumocytes are being infected by the staining, as well as uh, other similar uh, pathology and uh, immune inf infiltrates into the lung as a result of the infection. So you can't give a talk about SARS coronavirus antivirals without touching on the hydroxy, the developing hydroxychloroquine tragedy. Hydroxychloroquine was one of the first drugs identified in the SARS-CoV-1 epidemic in cell culture. So it was an obvious choice to investigate this at the beginning of the CoV-2 epidemic. This has gone down terribly with strong men around the world talking up this drug and bolstering it with uh, lousy uh, clinical science that has been a pathetic tragedy unfolding in front of our eyes. In part, this is uh, heartbreaking in that this drug has a laundry list of drug-drug interactions that can cause all kinds of problems for people taking this drug, as well as the potential for heart arrhythmias that can be deadly. It's looking like this is a false hope embedded in a false narrative. And uh, it's been really terrible to watch this uh, happen in real time. So there are two uh, really key studies that came out last week, two placebo randomized uh, controlled trials of hydroxychloroquine in humans that were just published in BMJ. And one study shown here, infected individuals with mild to moderate symptoms showed, uh, showed no improvement of uh, the use of hydroxychloroquine versus the control group, which didn't get didn't get the drug. In the second study, in patients needing oxygen, that there is no effect of hydroxychloroquine treatment uh, versus control. I think we can be generous and conclude that if there is an effect, the use of oral hydroxychloroquine in treatment of CoV-2 infection, it is uh, a, a mild effect. We don't know if um, hydroxychloroquine could be used as a prophylactic and there's an ongoing uh, placebo-controlled phase three study that, uh, that is being run by NIAD that uh, hopefully we'll hear about soon. Then remdesivir. So remdesivir is an adenosine nucleotide prodrug. You can see it down there in the corner of the slide. It's a generation three nucleotide prodrug that is, has protecting groups on the uh, pro-drug protecting groups on the uh, on the phosphate that you can see down here. It was selected from a screen by Gilead in a collaboration in collaboration with CDC and the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Disease disease after the SARS-CoV-1 uh, epidemic. It showed good activity in vitro against Ebola, 
but it turns out it was not active in a phase three efficacy trial to treat Ebola and virus infection. Um, but uh, it did go through a phase three study for Ebola. So it, this drug is, has uh, luckily was queued up uh, for use in the, in the current epidemic. It was shown to be active in a mouse model for MERS in an NHP study for SARS-CoV-2, which I'll show you in a, in a minute. The EC50, there are a couple different EC inhibitory concentration, 50% published for this drug against CoV-2. Um, there is 130 nanomolar, pretty potent uh, inhibition in, in, in that uh, publication, and about 800 nanomolar or, eight, or uh, 0.8 micromolar, which I just showed you against SARS-CoV-2. The dose for uh, greater than 40 kilograms of body mass is a 200 milligram loading dose intravenously, then 100 milligrams for five to 10 days. In the current uh, clinical study of, uh, of remdesivir against, against CoV-2, they showed that patients taking remdesivir had a shorter time to recovery compared to the control group. And really, this is amazing progress. Only three months or or I guess five months now, if you take the full, this is amazing progress. And for only having this epidemic go on for five months to already have a proved uh, therapeutic against the virus is just, a, is just incredible. It took over three years to get AZT approved against HIV and only took five months uh, for remdesivir. So remdesivir uh, targets the RNA uh, genome replication step of the viral life cycle. And it interferes with the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that uh, copies the viral genome needed to create an infectious uh, coronavirus virion. The target for this drug is uh, the NSP12 protein. And um, there's already a published uh, crystal structure of remdesivir monophosphate with uh, NSP12. There's Still some ongoing controversy about the exact mechanism of action, but the basic idea is shown here in this cartoon. Here you can see NSP12 making a copy of the viral genome template strand shown in blue, and the copy is shown here in red. And remdesivir triphosphate binds to the uh, nucleotide site in the RNA-dependent uh, RNA polymerase NSP12 uh, protein. Basically stops the and terminates the growing uh, copy chain, RNA chain that the that this viral protein is trying to trying to uh, produce, and that terminated chain uh, can't be used to assemble an infectious virion. Uh, production of the virus is stopped. So, if you're interested uh, in remdesivir, and I think you should be, uh, there are two uh, current really good sources of information. The first is a thorough review article in ACS Central Science, which I cite here. And the second paper, not really a, a peer-reviewed paper, is a regulatory document from the EU supporting the compassionate use of remdesivir. It has a lot of unpublished uh, technical details about the pharmacology of uh, remdesivir and Gilead's application to the, the EU governing body. So a number of pharmaceutical characteristics of the drug. It has six chiral centers. Um, Oh, an overall one year synthesis time uh, in Gilead's hands at this point. I'm sure they're trying to accelerate that. The prodrug is actually quite insoluble. Um, in a way, that's a good thing. It makes it uh, uh, possible for it to readily, in the prodrug form, permeate the lipid bilayer and get inside the cell. It needs to get inside the cell in order for it to, uh, to stop viral replication. The drug is an injectable. It's solubilized as a cyclodextrin complex which complexes the drug and makes it uh, soluble in water so it can be infused into a patient. As it turns out, if you're hopeful for an oral uh, form of this drug, this drug is a very strong uh, cytochrome oxidase substrate and will likely not be deliverable uh, by an oral route uh, because it would be metabolized rapidly in the uh, wall of the, uh, of the small intestine. The peak systemic concentration is about, uh, the prodrug is about nine micromolar, but it's rapidly uh, hydrolyzed into the nucleoside without the, uh, without the, the, the protecting moieties uh, to about 0.5 uh, micromolar. 
The drug substance is stable for 12 months at 30 degrees. And the toxicity they see as they increase the dose is kidney toxicity. And the prices that you see quoted in the, uh, in the literature talking about how Gilead might price this drug is anywhere for a course of therapy from $4,000 to $30,000. Remdesivir, like like all the drugs in this in this space, including um, uh, sovasuvir and uh, tenofovir alafenamide, is quite uh, complicated. The promoiety, uh, the pro drug, increases the membrane permeability. Uh, you can see uh, them here again, um, and it undergoes the drug undergoes two kinds of activation reactions. First, the promoiety is enzymatically cleaved inside the cell to generate the phosphate version of the drug shown here. Then this drug is phosphorylated by kinases to form the actual active drug. So this is the active species. It's, a, it's the activated high energy triphosphate form that can actually interfere with growing RNA chain. One of the really uh, great things about this class of uh, nucleoside inhibitors is that the triphosphate is highly cell impermeable owing to its uh, owing to its charge, and uh, once it gets phosphorylated, it has a, an extra long intracellular half life of forty hours or greater. So once you get the drug in, into the cell, it uh, it is it is present in the cell for for quite a long time, which is uh, which is a good thing. There's a there's a paper under review that looks at the clinical benefit of remdesivir in the, in the macaque model that I mentioned earlier from the same group at the Rocky Mountain Veterinary Branch of NIAD uh, out there in uh, eastern Montana. So you can see uh, the red are the macaques that got remdesivir and the black are uh, plus virus and the black are the macaques that got just the virus alone in a, in a sham treatment. And you can see a really clear impact of, of reducing disease in the model I presented earlier. You can also just really clearly see uh, the effect of remdesivir. This is the remdesivir arm here and here, and uh, this is the uh, sham treatment here and here, and you can see uh, just the gross anatomy of the lung of, the, of this macaque that got treatment looks, looks much better. The lung itself, uh, uh, histology of the lung, Looks much better. A lot of inflammation here and in infusion of, uh, of, of uh, immune system cells and also reduced uh, viremia in the lung and less damage. So this is uh, was a pretty early signal, um, was an early signal that uh, hopefully we would see impact of the drug in humans. Looking forward, remdesivir was shown to be, that remdesivir could be used prophylactically in macaques against uh, against MERS coronavirus in published papers. This paper came out uh, last Saturday of the Kaplan-Meier estimates of cumulative recoveries in humans in the adaptive COVID-19 treatment trial that is still ongoing. Uh, in this trial, the most pronounced effect was across all patients, they showed a statistically significant improvement in the rate of recovery. But the, the effect was most pronounced in patients needing oxygen therapy, but not high flow oxygen like you see down here. And I, I recommend that you get this uh, paper from the New England Journal of Medicine and take a look at it. It uh, was, was really, uh, uh, for me, it was really a happy day to uh, see, see these effects um, in patients. All right. And so the next is uh, agents to blunt immunopathology giving rise to uh, COVID-19. So there are a number of approaches to modify the host immune response, and this is a complex area with hundreds of clinical studies and clinicaltrials.gov if you take a look there. Something I like to say is that it's unlikely that there will be a good animal model for this aspect of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and so the clinical research is really uh, going to be the way to go here. Um, it's a real diverse set of approaches. I think a lot of these are going to be shown to not be very effective. There certainly isn't a lot of precedence for uh, taking um, vitamins for severe viral infections. There's already notable tension in the area. In the IL-6 inhibitor clinical outcomes, uh, there's one positive 
uh, IL-6 receptor antibody, and another sarilumab showed a negl negligible effect, so they're trying to work that out now. But there are some other positive studies that are worth noting, and I'll quickly show two. The first study looked at an IL-1 blockade. Here they used hydroxychloroquine and two HIV drugs in the control group and added the biologic uh, anakinra in the treatment arm. And they used a retrospective control group. This wasn't a randomized study. They did show uh, this drug anakinra in, that inhibits IL-1 signaling. And IL-1 is an essential class of cytokines that help uh, immunocompetent cells migrate to the site of infection. It also triggers fever uh, at the hypothalamus. And this paper showed a statistically significant effect of increased survival in severely Ill, Ill patients. So this is really interesting, recently published in Lancet. And the second uh, study in Frontiers of Immunology tried to add interferon back into the system by uh, giving inhaled interferon in a nebulizer. And uh, here the control group uh, got interferon as an aerosol, this uh, uh, antiviral drug that's approved in China, and the interferon plus the antiviral drug. And they were able to show a reduction in cytokines that you see here with the treatment of the interferon, implying lower uh, immune activation because of the, or dysregulated immune activation because of the presence of the interferon. And they also show, showed increased biremia uh, in the patients who were who were getting the uh, interferon aerosol. So that's also exciting and should be uh, followed up. It's, both of these studies are a relatively small number of patients. And last but certainly not least, we have exciting work in engineered therapeutic uh, immunoglobulins, IgGs, against SARS-CoV-2. Antibodies could prevent a cell from being infected. Antibodies that bind to uh, uh, CoV-2. You might not know this, but biopharmaceutical antibodies are the fastest growing sector in large pharma. It has been previously shown that they can be rapidly discovered, engineered, and put into clinical development. And I'm gonna walk you through that right now. So all of the currently relevant COV-2 therapeutics got their start elsewhere. And one of the most potent therapies uh, against Ebola was a triple monoclonal antibody cocktail rapidly developed by Regeneron against the Ebola entry protein. It was clinically proven to be effective in an NIH-sponsored adaptive trial against Ebola. And in this recent paper, they showed <clears throat> that this antibody cocktail developed in a mouse model against a specific Ebola virus protein was one of the most uh, potent therapeutic options to fight Ebola infection. And here's how they developed it and how they are developing a similar monoclonal antibody uh, therapeutic against uh, COVID-2. Regeneron worked with uh, NIH NIAD to establish a system to rapidly discover stable neutralizing antibodies to multiple viral, viral surface domains uh, of the Ebola virus. The key technology here is a humanized mouse that can make humanized um, uh, antibodies. And so what you can do with this mouse is, is you can take the infectious agent of interest, in this case, SARS-CoV-2, and adjuvenate that, um, that virus by mixing it with adjuvants, or maybe viral proteins as well, and vaccinate the, uh, the mouse. The mouse then uses its uh, humanized immune system to uh, teach B cells to make antibodies against that virus. And you can then sack the mouse and uh, isolate these B cells and isolate uh, antibodies from those B cells and get their sequences. You can also use multiple um, vaccination strategies and look at the influence of those sequences uh, as a function of the vaccination strategy. Simultaneously, you can also look at the human antibodies that are produced from natural infection uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And you can compare those human antibodies with the humanized antibodies that you got out of the mouse to see if you're on the right track. And you can then uh, get these sequences and test to see where they bind on the spike protein and use all kinds of cell and antiviral assays to, uh, to check the potency of this library of monoclonal antibodies which you've uh, developed in your humanized mouse model. Then you can take these, uh, this library of, uh, of antibodies, 
select uh, appropriate sequences for binding epitope diversity on the spike protein of the coronavirus, their potency, their stability, and their pharmacokinetics, their elimination rate, how long they'll stay in the blood to do their job. And then you can go ahead and, and uh, take those sequences, put them in yeast or other uh, protein producing, industrial protein producing uh, technologies and produce large amounts of these antibodies and begin efficacy studies in animals, preclinical safety studies that are required to go into humans and begin uh, rapidly begin GMP manufacturing in phase one, two, and three studies. Uh, and that's what they've done. You can see here that the duration of these antibodies are quite impressive. Um, let's take one of the middle doses. It looks like it has reasonable antibody titers up to 60 days from a single injection from, from the middle doses. And they're quite effective uh, against Ebola. Here you can see remdesivir. Remdesivir was part of this adaptive trial, and it wasn't effective. And if you may remember the ZMAP antibody, it turned out it didn't work. Regeneron triple cocktail was quite effective in helping patients uh, with, with Ebola infection. And Regeneron has identified the uh, immunoglobulin sequences for, as it turns out, two double cocktails and has ramped up production and will be starting a phase one study next month. Um, and so that is uh, really exciting. And uh, I would expect this to be a, a quite hopeful development to, to come online maybe in the winter. All right, conclusions and uh, final thoughts. So progress has been rapid on the therapeutic front. It's, uh, you know, as I said earlier, it's really been amazing to watch. I think uh, it's been caused by, uh, by some luck, uh, some foresight by, uh, by a number of groups. Remdesivir does not rescue patients at the high end of the clinical scale for uh, COVID-19. Um, I think, you know, there's definitely, it's, it's not a panacea, but definitely, uh, you know, one tool, first uh, therapeutic tool in the armamentarium against this virus. And so, you know, it's, it's really great to have that. Watch the randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled trials come out in the antiviral and immune therapy space. You know, I think we're going to be seeing a bunch of work with remdesivir plus, uh, plus other uh, uh, interventions. Uh, there's going to be continued confusion caused by the multitude of exploratory and uncontrolled clinical studies, and uh, I think we all can um, work hard to try to help educate those around us about the importance of being careful of drawing conclusions from these uncontrolled studies. We'll need to uh, and I think we're definitely going to see ramping up of the NHP model to touch other therapeutic modalities, things more experimentally, agents that people are trying to uh, promulgate forward into the, into the preclinical and clinical space. And I think there's going to be great progress on that front uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Can't rule out other approved drugs moving forward from screens, and that'll be interesting to watch. And uh, I'm definitely going to be... Uh, uh, looking at those studies as they come out. Monoclonal antibodies, I feel, have a potential, a huge potential through late fall and winter and um, could be used both therapeutic and, therapeutically and prophylactically. I think, you know, particularly in healthcare workers and, and nursing homes and places like that where there's a lot of uh, transmission going on could be an extremely important tool to help fight the, the clusters of, of infection that we're seeing arising all over the place. And finally, I think uh, complicated therapeutic modalities like pre-exposure prophylaxis are possible to model in the NHP, but uh, PrEP studies in phase three trials are going to take time, particularly as the number of infected individuals drop. It's going to be hard to reach statistical significance as the number of infections go down. So, Anyway, thank you uh, very much, and I look forward to uh, getting your questions and, and answering answering them in, a, in another small talk. So everybody have a great day and, uh, and take care.